Great to have you join us and uh, good morning. Welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and across the world. Welcome to Breakfast Central. As always, for the next two hours, we have some of the major conversations happening here in Nigeria and in slightly in other parts of the continent. I am Osaogi Ogbon. And I am Olive Emodi, thanking you for joining us and assuring you that the next two hours will indeed be worth your time. We have so much to talk about. There's good news and there's bad news. Which will we start with first? Um... Uh, well, I mean, the cabinet reshuffle, maybe. Um, I don't know if that's. No, no, I'm asking of the good news or bad news. You should choose one first. So I'm in the middle, you know, with regards to cabinet reshuffle. You know, so the, uh, the, the cabinet reshuffle is, is, is in between. You know, it could be good, it could be bad. Depends on how you see it. Um, there's also, you know, news stories about NYSC um, um, fees being increased. Or so that's the good news. Thousand. I wanted us to save the best for last. So let's talk about the bad news first. Okay. So. Cabinet reshuffle, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. Uh, I do know that the government of the day had been very, very clear about how they were going to hold their ministers to account. And one of the ways in which they were going to do that, in fact, they're assured that ministers that didn't perform up to power will be fired. And one of the ways they ensured that they tried to keep to that promise was to have the ministerial update, which many people will argue did not yield any result, because at that time there are people who... I mean, people were waiting for firings to be done, and nothing was done. So far, the only firing we've done is uh, Beta Idu, and that's, of course, because she was in the news for controversy. Uh, so this reshuffling, I think the only way we can give our feedback on what it will be like, if it's good news or if it's just their news, is after the reshuffle has been done. You know, Also, it makes me worry about... Um, putting people in random places without being sure of what their capacity is. So if I have the capability to function in the capacity of Minister of Women Affairs, and tomorrow they feel like, oh, you're not doing well in, Minister of Women, uh, in the Ministry of Women Affairs, and then they move me to the Minister of, uh, to become Minister of uh, Information, you know, f for me it's a bit concerning that if I haven't delivered in Minister of, Ministry of Women Affairs, what's the guarantee that I will deliver in Ministry of uh, yeah. Information? So, I mean, so it's, for me, it's two different things. You know, the first one will be, you know, you know, I think I've repeatedly asked what are the metrics with which we rate the performance of ministers, you know. And after the first year of the uh, um, Tinubu administration, you remember that the ministers came out to come and, you know, exp explain what they had done for report the, card. you know, yeah, show their report card. Not very many people were impressed. You know, everybody just saw it as a charade um, and, it, you know, it completely meaningless, you know, to a lot of Nigerians because the reality on ground, you know, for the average Nigerian shows that, there's not really been, you know, a lot of effect from these persons. And yes, you know, like you've mentioned, you know, when these ministers were being screened back then, there were many questions raised as to whether these were round pegs in, in round holes, you know, or not. You know, of course, your round pe pegs in square holes or not. You know, what, what was the metrics with which these persons were picked? Um, were they picked because they have experience in these, you know, uh, different ministries? It's the first SKMO, um, knowledgeable enough in the aviation, you know, sector. Even if yeah, he's been given quotas for being able to handle that, that ministry well enough. But there's many of them, you know, all 40 plus of them. You know, questions were asked as to what exactly is the relevance of this person in this place and how we sure that they will be able to handle these ministries effectively. And we can obviously see the results um, one year plus into the administration. There is that. And then another thing is, what exactly do you call a reshuffle? Are you moving people? To different places. That's what you know, are you, are you sounds changing like. them, or yes, are you do dropping some people and then hiring new ones to replace them? You know, th those you know for me are the things that are important. You know, if you're moving one person who's been here and hasn't really shown to have been a successfully performing minister, and then you're moving that person to another place, well, what relevance are they going to be in the new place? So it doesn't really seem like the government has again thought about who would be rightly placed for this role who has experience um, either through their career, you know, for this particular role. Many people back then said that, you know, the ministerial appointments were done to settle political um, um, debts. Uh, yeah. You know, and of course, you know, to repay favors. Which then goes back to what I have always said, that we need to rejig our mode of appointments, screening, and swearing in of these ministers. We need to go back to the drawing board and fix that because... If you're, you're appointing someone, you know, they should know what portfolio you're appointing them into. So they're adequately prepared so that when they're being screened, they're screened vis-a-vis -vis that portfolio. I remember when Beta Edu was being screened. You know, she had her previous uh, ex experience, I think, was in the, in the, as Commissioner of Health or something. But she had worked more in the health space. So if you're coming 
and you're asking her questions about health, she knows subconsciously, okay, this is where I'm going to function, and she knows if she's adequately prepared for that. Or if you're, you're inviting an Obianuju uh, Kennedy, and she, she's coming knowing that she's coming to function in the capacity of women affairs, and if she can't, you know, she's stepping down or rejecting it. But before then, she's adequately saying this and these and these are what I want to achieve. Because if you remember, their questions were just very, a number of the questions were very vague, not very targeted, you know, because we weren't sure what, what capacity they were functioning in. So, yes, like you said, I'm hoping that the reshuffling will be more of looking at the scorecard in the past over a year to see those who have worked, those who have worked being you know, commended, appreciated, and those who haven't worked should be fired and there should be fresh people brought in maybe. Yeah, but again, again, you're basing you know, your ratings of these persons based on what metrics in particular. You know, and if the government doesn't have its metrics with which it rates the performance of these persons, then it really cannot justify its reasons for firing them. If it simply just throws a person into the Minister of, Ag Minister of Agriculture or Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, or Ministry of Education, exactly, what are the things that have been set as metrics for, for, for performance? And this is what we want to see in the next one year or in the next two years. And if they've not been able to meet up with those standards or with those you know, metrics, then they should be able to say, okay, the reason that we've not gotten here, these were our projections, this is where we hope that we're able to reach, you know, but the reason we haven't gotten here is because we've not received support here or we've not received funding here or there's a lot of bureaucracy, you know, taking place, you know, installing it. So these are some of the things that I think they should be questioning, you know, um, themselves about. Um, if they, again, are going to be just flipping people around or they're going to be firing some and, you know, hiring better hands to handle those ministries, these, you know, are, you know, are the things that they should consider. If not... We're really just going to have four years go by with ministers that Nigerians are not even aware of their existence, which, you know, to a large extent, you know, um, um, is really what happens. If you ask the average Nigerian who's the, the minister for education, for example, yeah, I'm sure that very, very many Nigerians would not know um, Professor Tahir Um If you ask many Nigerians who is the uh, minister for, for agriculture, for example, there's, there's many of them. Many Nigerians a number of them were sworn names. in, and after being sworn in, we didn't hear of them any, you know, yeah. anymore. Anyway, let, let's move away from the cabinet reshuffle. That's a conversation that we're hoping to have much later on this morning. To share with you some good news that the current administration has increased the allowance, popularly referred to as Alawi, of the Nigerian Youth Service Corps members from the current 33,000 Naira to 77,000 Naira, effective July 2024. Now, this was disclosed. Um, in, you know, uh, on Wednesday via a press statement made available to the press and signed by the NYSC's Acting Director, Information and Public Relations, ADIPR, Caroline Embo. The reason for this is to be in line with the enactment of the National Minimum Wage Amendment Act. So congratulations to the current administration. Congratulations to all the youth corps members. Your allowances will be officially increased to 77,000. Are you excited about that? Um, I mean, yes, you know, uh, yes. Um, it's, it's a good step um, for NYC members, you know, who are scattered across the country. Um, but just like many people have asked, you know, when the minimum wage was increased 70,000 naira, has the government officially started paying 70,000 naira as minimum wage? Have state governments started paying 70,000 naira as minimum wage? So, so you know? from what we're saying here, it was effective July 2024. So, okay. I mean, I'm we're hoping that core members, yeah, we're in September, core members can confirm this. Please, uh, if you're a Ni National Youth Service Corps member, let us know. Tweet at New Central TV. You can tweet at us individually to let us know what your last alert was. You know, if you had gotten the 77,000 naira yet, and if yes, maybe that calls from so for some form of celebration. And I know there's temptation to say we've increased it, but the quality of life has reduced. But the truth is, the quality of life, <laughs> yes, has reduced. But but I mean, it could still have been at 33,000, and we'll be pining. So I, I think that this is some ray of sunshine that we should celebrate. Congratulations. We'll be talking more about these stories, but let's share with you our top stories, and then we'll let you know what's happening today on Breakfast Headlines. Reactions trail Justice Nyako's withdrawal from Mazi Namdekanu's case. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. We'll talk about this some more today. Presidency hits on looming cabinet reshuffle. The conversation with which we've started today's broadcast, and you know what the implications of this might mean, we'll find out. Court bars PDP from dissolving pro WKS school in Rivers. The drama continues there. Abuja Primary School teachers protest 
unpaid salaries. It's one thing to increase minimum wages, another thing to actually pay these salaries. The newspaper front pages, of course, will be reviewed this morning with our analysts and with you when we open the phone lines. But now, it's breakfast headlines. Well, let's begin breakfast headlines by telling you that the special advisor to President Bola Tinubu on information and strategy, Bayo Nonuga, has revealed that the president will soon reshuffle his cabinet. Nonuga confirmed this to State House correspondents on Wednesday at the presidential villa in Abuja. He noted that Tinubu has ordered his ministers to ensure that they engage the public by publicizing what the government is doing in their various ministries. And the Senate on Wednesday confirmed the appointment of Justice Kudirat Kekirekung as a substantive Chief Justice of Nigeria after screening. During the session, Kekirekung declared that all pre-election matters must be concluded at the Court of Appeal. She also frowned against corruption in the judiciary, stating that she would not tolerate any form of it. Uh, put the question, will the Senate approve the nomination for confirmation of Honorable Justice Kudirat Kekerekung for appointment as Chief Justice of Nigeria. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those again say nay. The aye serve it. And out of corruption matters, Justice Emeka Nwiti of the Federal High Court Abuja has adjourned the alleged money laundering case filed against, or, uh, filed by rather, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission (EFCC) against the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bello, until October 30, 2024. The adjournment came as Bello moved to the Supreme Court to file an appeal seeking to set aside the arrest warrant issued by the trial court on October 17th. Now, to education sector, the Academic Staff Union of Universities (ASU) has issued a 14-day strike warning ultimatum to the federal government to resolve some lingering issues dating as far back as 2009. ASU President Emmanuel Oshereke, in a statement issued on Wednesday, said, the body is seeking the conclusion of the renegotiation of the 2009 federal government ASU agreement based on the Nimi Briggs Committee's draft agreement of 2021. Away from Nigeria now, officials from organizations in Kenya have presented their findings in an investigation on police conduct during the June 25th protests in Nairobi during a joint press conference. Amnesty International called for the creation of a commission to investigate the deaths of scores of people from the unlawful use of police force three months after mass anti-government protests. In South Africa, the main opposition leader in Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, has been poisoned as part of an assassination attempt and is being treated in hospital, his party says. Mlungisi Mankaya lives in exile in neighboring South Africa following a violent crackdown on pro-democracy activists in Africa's last remaining absolute monarchy. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. Let's head back now to Breakfast Central and, of course, bring you our top stories. I am Osao Gie Ogboa.
primary school teachers under the Federal Capital Territory Administration Local Education Authority earlier today barricaded, or that, that was yesterday, barricaded the gate of the Abuja Municipal Area Council in Abuja. The teachers who came out in their numbers say the area councils within the FCT have refused to pay about 60% of their salary areas for the last 25 months, despite repeated appeals to effect the payment. News Central Joshua Imarai has more on this report. Primary school teachers under the local education authority in Abuja. These teachers are protesting over an unpaid salary backlog of about 25 months. We are here to express our displeasure over what the area council chairman is doing to us. The primary school teachers have been neglected. We want to appreciate the Honorable Minister of FCT who has paid agreed to help the area councils and he paid 40 percent and he said the remaining 60 percent the area councils should go and pay but as i'm talking to you now none of the area council chairman have paid a dime my deputy just uh, mentioned the 25 months minimum uh, national minimum wage areas in addition to that the earlier primary school teachers have not been paid the 35 thousand naira wage award. The, their counterpart from the UBEB and SEB have been enjoying this since the implementation. They say all attempts to speak with the chairman of the Abuja Municipal Area Council have remained unfruitful. Whenever we come to seek for our dialogue with our chairman, he never gives us orders. Like today, before today, we have met, two weeks ago, we have met with the director, admin, AMAC. So why we are here today is to remind them, to tell them that we are, have come to occupy a space. If other counterpart of UBEB, that is Universal Basic Education teacher, will be enjoying benefits. And these teachers are our junior. Like me, I am a deep teacher. Chairman, teaching in the school, and my, 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 my allowances, my rights are not given. Then what do you expect me to do? The demands of the teachers under the ages of the Nigerian Union of Teachers and here in Abuja still remains the same. We are demanding that there are 25 months of arrears being paid for them to return back to the classrooms. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarayi. That's such a heartbreaking story to take, really, because... Osage, we, we understand that teachers, I, I think the teachers are, are one of the under, underrated career paths. And they're very important, highly important. And I'm talking of teachers from primary level, primary education to tertiary institution. But I don't think that as a nation we pay teachers as much attention as we should pay them. And we accord them as much regard as we should accord them. 60% of unpaid salaries for the last 25 months. How, how are they expecting these teachers? to meet up with the current reality of the rising cost of living. How do they expect the teachers who will come and teach their children in the schools to be able to teach them well with joy in their hearts, do their jobs happily? You know, it's, it's a very sad, sad situation. I'm hoping that the government looks into this. Uh, Federal Capital Territory Administration Local Education Authority, you know, they have barricaded the gate and they are protesting. We do not know if this protest will continue today. But it's something that must be looked into. Yeah, I mean, if we're being honest, I think the core is that Nigeria is not a country that values education. Education, absolutely. You know, that, that's where it starts from. We don't value education, and it's not just the teachers. It's, all, it's the whole education sector, you know, in, in the schools, in the children themselves, you know, and, of course, then the teachers. Um, our funding for education is still one of the poorest in the world. We've almost never met up with our... Uh, UNICEF um, um, or UNICEF or UNESCO Uni um, U UNESCO um, I think yeah for um, education funding um, on the state level we don't value education either you know if, if you're a teacher you know you expect that you're all definitely going to be one of the poorest paid in the whole society I don't think we've ever done we up to 13% um, allocation in our budget to education no we don't, we don't. You know, and so that for me is the, the core issue here we do not value education and you can even hear it in you know, the, the average Nigerian conversation um, concerning school, you can hear it with, I remember that there was, um, let's not bring the vice president into it, but <laughs> you can hear it in our regular conversations that, you know, education is not one of the key things that we value. You know, Nigerians would value, you know, any rich person more than, you know, an educator. Um, until we change that, you know, it's it's almost never going to be Because different. the people who are at the helm of affairs have their, their children in schools where they have British well. curriculum, American There's curriculum, well. they're paying an arm and a leg, and they can afford to There's pay them, well. you know, so, so they're not on, really bothered about the other ones. And this is, again, federal and state level. 
there's not much value for education. They would simply just give the, you know, the barest minimum, um, keep them alive at least, but there's no intentional effort you know, into improving our education sector, into, into building better schools, into looking at how the kids are faring. I, re I remember, um, I've seen some vi videos from this content creator, um, Dan Bello, uh, who's a teacher in China, um, and I see the kind of things that they teach primary school kids in China um, on that very, very basic level, um, the, the effort that they put into the education sector and how these kids, you know, should be grown, you know. And we forget that these kids will not compete just with their peers here in Nigeria. They're going to compete on a global scale. The people that they're going to compete with in the world are people who are schooled in China, in the UK, in the US, and the quality of education they're receiving there would not be anything, not because we don't have teachers who are good enough, but because our government hasn't seen it important to invest in our education that's sector. The is, there's no reason a professor should be earning 400,000 naira. It's embarrassing. Yeah. There's, no, there's no reason on this earth for a professor who is at the peak of his career, because, I mean, that... He can't, that he is, can't go further than that. Yeah, um, to be earning 400,000. If you don't get into administration, uh, administrative you know, um, duties, which, of course, makes you VC, deputy vice chancellor, or anything like that, but at the peak of your career, um, there's no reason why your salary should be 400,000 naira. But that is, you know, about the average salary um, for a Nigerian professor. And that's what will discourage more people from getting into the education sector because you think of yourself, you think of education, think of the effort and say, ah, which one will pay me more? It's yeah. really sad. Anyway, let's move on from that conversation. President Bola Tinumbu is set to reshuffle his cabinet, possibly before the 1st of October, according to spokesperson Bayo Onanuga. While no specific timeline has been given, some ministers are expected to be dropped with others reassigned to different ministries. At the recent Federal Executive Council meeting, the president directed ministers to actively communicate achievements of his administration, urging them to overcome social media and media reluctance. Now, Tinubu's cabinet, one of the largest since 1999, has faced criticism for its size and political appointments, sparking concerns over the cost of governance. So, cabinet is short. Let me tell you, I don't have any timeline. The president has uh, expressed his desire to reshuffle his cabinet, and he will do it. I don't know whether he wants to do it before October 1, but he will surely do it. Uh, so that's what I will say. He has not given us any timeline when he wants to do it, but he will do it. He has expressed his plan. He wants to do it. He wants to reshuffle. Joining us now is non-commercial whistleblower Madi Shio. Good morning, Mr. Madisho. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, good morning. All right. Uh, the good news, is this good news that the president is looking to reshuffle his cabinet on or before the 1st of October? Um, I mean, it's not yet confirmed date, but do you find this as good news? Well, I would rather read the good news by because out of it, I will, do, I, will do, I will draw so much wisdom and knowledge and guidance in the good news, good news Bible, not the good news from the villa that has never been good. And in any event, can you please remind me that uh, there is a cabinet in place? I thought there is none. Going at what, looking at what we are going through in this country, you will never believe that there is any cabinet. And if he's going to reshuffle his cabinet, what are the reasons? Not for performance or failure or mistaken identities. If he is going to reshuffle the cabinet based on non-performance, uh, it means it's a case of uh, a port calling kettle black because he also represents absolute, total, colossal failure. There is nothing about Tinubu that he will point out at a minister that I am dropping you because you have failed. Because he has also failed the nation woefully completely, entirely, round the clock, he's presiding over a failed nation. So please excuse me. If there is any cabinet in place, I need to be reminded. I don't know about one that is existing. Are you saying, uh, Mr. Madisho, that of all the ministers that are that form a part of President Bola Metinubu's cabinet, that there is not one that you can say has done a relatively good job? Well, a, a minister or a group of ministers are supposed to portray what they have done for the country. If there were a cabinet in place, 
a functional, reliable, dependable, competent, qualified cabinet. We shouldn't be in this abject poverty. We shouldn't be in this insecurity. Educational institutions collapsed. Health institutions collapsed. Penury all over the horizon. People live in abject poverty. Nobody is sure at home, in the industry, in workplace, even in cemetery. People have been pauperized. 200 million people facing poverty. 134 million people in abject poverty. 44 million children out of school. 75 million Nigerians are hypertensive. Of them, only 20 are on medication. The remainder are aware that they have hypertension, but they can't afford the money. I can continue ad infinitum. So what is there to celebrate? What is there to change? I think rather than changing the cabinet, he should include the cabinet. Like I recommend him three people for employment. I recommend that uh, he appoints a higher law as the Minister for Finance so that he can continue from where he stopped. He can also appoint Shane, his son, because what is the difference between Shane and a minister? He flies presidential jet. He attends cabinet meetings, federal cabinet meetings. He inspects guard of honors. I saw him in Meduguri where he donated 500 million naira. He was received by the governor, by all permanent secretaries, by all commissioners. Commissioner of police were there, other security agents were there. He was inspecting a guard of honor. He should appoint uh, his son chain as what as the chief of staff and add him another portfolio of minister for, 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 for culture so that he can hold as many parties as he can. I can also recommend that he appoints Rarara, that house a musician who only promotes people that are of questionable circumstances. I think that will make the cabinet look better. Yeah. I mean, um, um, Madi Sheo, there's, there's so much to unpack from what you've said, you know, and uh, speaking about the president's son, you know, I did also see you know th those videos or that clip, you know, of him getting down from the airplane, you know, and uh, you know there are people lined up to shake his hand. You know, I think also with the son of the yeah. vice president, I believe. I'm not sure who that was, but um, pretty shocking, very, very shocking. Um, but let let's you know um, go further. Do you think that the time we've spent with the current administration is enough to rate the performance of these ministers? Should they maybe be given a little more time? They've, they've not been there for up to two years. Should they be given a little more time, you know, so that we can then see, you know, how much change they've been able to bring to the Nigerian people? The gestation period for every soul is nine months. A baby is kept in the mother's womb for a maximum of nine months. And once at gestation, it is expelled. That should be the yardstick and the parameter and the scale of assessing every human action. If within one year, six months, almost twice the gestation period of a human being, a minister or a cabinet or a regime cannot make or impact positively on people, then that cabinet, that set of people, that president should bury their heads in shame. Nigerians have never had it so bad. Under Tinubu, it has been funny budgets. He signed a budget where a borehole will be sunk at 193 million naira at a previous constituency. Same Tinubu signed a budget of or a budget where. 185 million naira will be spent to sunk one single borehole. Under Tinubu, you find extra budgetary, unappropriated, unapproved expenditure. Example, the purchase of the aeroplane without a single appropriation, and he started Nigerian to help with you. Under Tinubu, we see his wife, an unelected wife of the president, allocated 701 million naira from taxpayers' money. As if she's doing anybody a favor last week, I saw her doling out 50,000 naira to 1,000 people. So I told her, what of the balance? Because that money, 701 million naira given to her, is illegal, is immoral, is unconstitutional, is unacceptable. 
Therefore, if she has given out 50,000 Naira to 1,000 people, we are waiting for her to return the balance because that money is not supposed to be spent by her. We've seen so many scandalous expenditures, some of them nonsensical, stupid, and dangerous being incurred under the table, all in the name of democracy. For us, for majority Nigerians, Tinubu and his cabinet represent industrial tragedy. It represents failure. It represents breach of trust. It represents uncertainty. It represents man's inhumanity to man. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it, it, so, so it, assuming that he still goes ahead, you know, because Bayan Onuga is not even sure if this will happen or when this will happen. Um, but if he still goes ahead with a cabinet reshuffle, would you suggest taking people and, you know, placing them in, in different ministries, you know, just moving the pieces? Or would you suggest replacing all these ministers uh, completely with new heads? Let him do whatever he wants to do. You don't get anything good out of evil. If he likes, let him go to the evil forest and uh, engage spirits. Let him apply for angels to become his ministers. What is important is uh, if the head is rotten, the entire body will be rotten. You can even bring a medical doctor and make him the minister for health. But what is his background? What is his history? What is his record? Matters a lot, not even the qualification. Therefore, you find putting them in the right place at the right moment, at the right time, is just a fairy tale. Under Tinubu, nobody can succeed because it is just a one-man show. If it were not a one-man show, this man will not have the courage, Tinubu, will not have the guts, will not have the audacity and the temerity to dip his hand deep into the public treasury and buy an aeroplane. And nobody can tell him, Bona Tinubu, you are wrong in the cabinet. Nobody can say you are wrong in the Senate. Nobody can say you are wrong in the National Assembly. I mean, Nigeria is in trouble. Nigeria is in danger. Nigeria is in darkness. Nigeria is in dire need of honest, responsible, God-conscious, God-fearing people who will, do, who will do exactly what they said. Not people who will tell you good morning while it is midnight. All right. Or people who will tell you come, but they really want you to run away from them. Speaking of people who will tell you to come, but really want you to run away from them, the EFCC has asked Yahya Bello to come to court. Unfortunately, this uh, yesterday was supposed to be another court appearance, and he wasn't in court again. What do you make of the whole uh, issues going on between the EFCC, Yahya Bello, him going to their office or their headquarters, not being arrested? They've given an explanation mm -hmm. for that. Uh, saying that he came with a governor who currently has him immunity working hand in hand in the car park and if they attempted to arrest him things you know could have gotten out of hand and he still hasn't come and now they filed fresh charges from 82 billion naira to 110 billion naira yeah yeah is an anointed son he's an anointed son in the villa you can't touch him Somebody who has a living father and a living mother in the corridors of power is called untouchable. Yahya Bello is acting a drama and a script, well written at the villa. He is also acting and he is dancing to a drum whose rhythm he understands very well. The drum is a drum from the villa. He is being protected. I am surprised that EFCC are playing this game because Yahya Bella reported and they said he came along with the governor was immunity. Okay, tell the governor to go away and then detain Yahya Bello. No, Yahya Bello go and come back. After leaving, they went and laid siege on Kogi State Governor's Lodge to arrest him. They couldn't arrest him. They charged him to court. He didn't go to court. Yahya Bello understand exactly what the game of politics is all about. Yahya Bello is anointed. He is being officially protected. And all these new charges are just halu balus 
they are just high level, high wire pretenses. They are just meant to insult the collective intelligence of Nigerians. But a day will come. As daylight chases away darkness, shall, so shall all this, this mad Alex, who are looting the treasury, high, empty, and dry, will be reduced into pitiable, combustible materials. They will be brought to shame, and their names will be written in the book of shame in this world and in the next world. And they will never enjoy that loot. That loot will be the source of their agony in life, will be the source of their fear, of their sleeplessness, and of their melancholy. Yeah, well, I mean, many people would also then say that, I mean, in response to, you know, your last statements, you know, that former governors and presidents, you know, are, you know, living large, you know, and that karma that Nigerians always wish them never works. You know, former President Buhari is currently, of course, you know, enjoying himself in, uh, in Daura uh, without having any, any worries <laughs> whatsoever, you know. So many people don't necessarily believe in that karma. But yeah, looking, look of course, once again at the yeah. Ayabilo's, uh, you know, issue, how much of a, I, I, of a I, I, stain I, I, is this? Yeah, I, I just, I mean, you could go on, but you, I just want to ask, how much of a stain is this on the Bola Tinubu administration, you know, and of course, you know, the EFCC chairman, Olao Lukoyede, if this is, you know, the way that we are seeing one person seemingly stronger than the whole institution of the EFCC. Um, you remember the, the Bible and the Quran gave story of Pharaoh, the, Bibli the biblical Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a field day. He killed, he made, he incapacitated, he sent fear. Yeah. He looted. He became, he made himself look like a god, as if tomorrow will not come. But when tomorrow came, and when karma came to play, look at how uh, Pharaoh was subsumed, annihilated, taken away, and killed on account of his own past. Buhari may be enjoying in Dawara now, along with all his looting ministers. Bola may be enjoying now, may be enjoying even thereafter, but karma is real. Ask him about it, says Seko. Karma is real. Ask Saad Bari. Ask Hisan Fabri. Ask Dokuno Wadai. Ask so many of them. They are there. Karma is real. It will come to Nigeria. It will come to the villa. It will go to Daura. It will go to every house of a betrayer. It will go to every city. It will go to every village. You and me are waiting to laugh. Last, we shall laugh loudest. We shall watch from the comfort of our rooms how these people are going to be reduced into people that are deserving no sympathy, into people that thought tomorrow will not come. Tomorrow will visit them and it will visit them with no mercy, with no compassion, and with no consideration. All right. Um, let's move away briefly from uh, Yahaya Bello to see what's happened with uh, Namdi Kanu's case. Uh, we've seen that uh, the judge has recused herself from the case. We wanted to find out your thoughts regarding you know, how the matter has been handled so far. It's been on for the longest time. He's accused the court of being biased and saying that if the DSS does not uh, subject itself to the rulings of the court. He can understand that, but that not the court itself being biased and not obeying uh, the decisions of the Supreme Court. So what's your thought regarding how... I have said this handled? over and over again. And I have said this in the past, and I will repeat the same thing here now. If Boko Haram criminals can be given amnesty, be trained, and given commercial support. If Sunday Agoha is still a free price working on the street, if uh, Ghani Adams is still a traditional ruler, and if this uh, guy in the southwest, uh, in the south south, uh, what do you what do you call him? Uh, remind me his name. If they are still alive, Dokubo Asari, if Dokubo Asari is still free, and if Tom Polo 
is still a federal government contractor. I don't see any reason why Kanu should be behind bars. They have committed more crimes than being alleged to have been committed by 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 by, by Khan, Nam, 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 Khan. If Kanu cannot be released on the basis of legality, he should be released on the basis of equity, fairness. If he cannot get justice, at least he can be given freedom based on equity. Because these people that have criminal records all over the horizon have committed more crimes than, 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 Kanu, than what Hakanu is being alleged to have committed. Therefore, for me, keeping uh, Kanu behind bars is immoral, is illegal, is unconstitutional, is a crime, and he's being cherry picked for persecution. For now, he is being persecuted. Luckily, it will go around. One day, there will be the people that will be persecuted, and I will celebrate that. We will remind them that uh, when Kanu was behind bars, you were in charge. Your children were in charge. Your daughters were in charge. Your uncles and parents were in charge. Therefore, now, keep quiet, remain silent, enjoy what you have subjected other people to enjoy in the past. Yeah. Um, in the interest of time, I don't know if you can squeeze in, you know, two of your thoughts, you know, um, into this, uh, the time that we have uh, left. You know, I, I want you, you know, to quickly share your thoughts on, because I've seen, you know, what you put out concerning the Edo State elections um, and how that turned out. Um, but I also find your views very interesting concerning the go current governor of uh, Zamfara State. You know, of course, you know, and his accusations to Bilo Matawale of... Um, you know, allegedly aiding banditry in the state. Um, so if you can quickly share your thoughts on Edo State and maybe also on Zamfara um, as quickly as possible, um, we would love to hear you. In Edo, we saw the miscalculations of Obaseki, especially in relation to his deputy governor, that eventually made it possible for other people to key in and made it impossible for him to have a successor. He has paid a supreme price. But then the totality of the election was the usual APC fraud. There were clear substitution of votes. There were rigging, there were clear vote buying. APC keyed into the poverty that people are facing and were giving out a thousand naira, ten thousand naira for people to vote. But then whatever is obtained by fraud will go away through fraud and will not succeed. On Zampara, yes, I told Dauda Lawan, stop blaming Matawale for the issue or on the issue of banditry. Concentrate, make a difference, show the, the difference between you and Matawale. Give Zampara people good governance, <clears throat> give them good education, good health care, good infrastructure, get people employed, do youth, a youth employment program. Ensure that you invest in security. Don't loot people's money. Don't steal people's money because that will make you look different. And I told him, there are billions of public opinions, mostly negative, on who? On Matawale. That is enough for Matawale to harvest for the rest of his life. He should allow that public opinion to decimate Matawale. The public have done him so much good by making so much commentary on Matawale. Therefore, continuing to blame Matawale may end up making him another Buhari. Yeah, but, Buhari but here's, here's failed, the problem. Failed war. Yeah, Madisha, apologies. Buhari you know, but but here, here's the issue with it, right? So, um, Bilo Matawale has reacted, you know, and of course, denied those allegations. He's also said that, you know, uh, uh, the governor should uh, go swear by the Quran if he's certain of what he's accusing him of. But we're, we live in a country that has laws. We, we live in a country that if allegations like that are made, you would expect that there will be proper investigations. Questions will be asked. It's not a swear by the Quran situation, and it's also not a thing that, sh you know, karma should be brought in. There's no karma in our constitution. So, I mean, if, if you hear such allegations and everybody just moves on, you know, like it's nothing, shouldn't we be worried? You will be more worried if I share with you
review 230-page report that was written under the chairmanship of the former Inspector General of Police who investigated the issue of banditry in Zampara. He mentioned names of traditional rulers, names of former governors, names of members of the National Assembly serving and, and past and former, names of state assembly hold or holders in the state that are responsible for the escalation of banditry in Zafara. I have the copy right now with me. None of them, today is 18 months after the report. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was prosecuted. Nobody was arraigned. Nobody was even, well, nobody pointed a finger to a single one of them. If such is what obtains in Zampara and in Nigeria, then God save Zampara, God save Nigeria, today will be the beginning of banditry. I also invite you to read a book called, titled, I Am a Bandit, written by somebody from Sokoto, an academician. There you will understand banditry as, a, as, as what as an enterprise, a brewing, a rewarding enterprise is in the North, a brilliant, a, a successful enterprise in the whole of Nigeria. Wherever you see banditry, it is an enterprise being funded silently and loudly by people in high places, in government, in so many other sectors of society. That is the tragedy in Nigeria today. All right. And now let's, uh, I think on the final note, my final question will be regarding the Edo elections. Do you think that the Edo elections set the tone for what should be expected uh, with the forthcoming elections as well happening in Undo and in uh, Anambra states much later? I will just remind you two clips. One clip when Boyle actually was in London prior to 2023 election, he said, uh, you snatch power and run away with it. And he snatched power. He ran away with it. He entered into the villa running. And now he is gasping in the villa, gasping, looking for oxygen to succeed. I will remind you another clip. Just nine days before Edo elections, he was addressing people. He said, if you want a door, I will give you a door. And to his eternal credit, the rich are going to So a door and that uh, alakate dinner in London where he said the formula of getting elected is to snatch boxes, to snatch while I run away with it. If these two combined formulas, are being watched by Nigerians and they are doing nothing. I would rather have the elections of 20 to 7 results announced tomorrow. They swear in Sudibu tomorrow for the second term. So at least we are saved the cost of elections. We are saved the mayhem associated election. We are saved the killings and the maimings and the shouting and the air pollution. Let them just appoint uh, swear in Sudibu tomorrow because going by a door, he has made up his mind, except that uh, many Nigerians, including myself, are praying because I believe in prayers, day in and day out, at every opportunity, so that uh, those who are making life difficult for us shall be taken away from the political platform of Nigeria by God himself for now and forever so that we can have peace, we can have tranquility and harmony and growth. Marisha, who always uh, interested in speaking with you. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. Thank we wish you. you a very interesting day ahead. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, um, really, really interesting conversation there. And, and of course, you know, this is uh, mostly centered around the uh, current situation across the country, um, including plans by the current administration for a cabinet reshuffle that may or may not happen. And of course, the little details around in that. But let's move on before, of course, we move into the second half. A federal high court in Abuja has restrained the national leadership of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, from dissolving the executive committee in River State, which are loyal to FCT minister Nyesom Wike. The court also blocked the formation of any interim committees to replace these executives at the state local government and ward levels. The ruling followed an ex parte motion filed by the Rivers PDP led by WK loyalists. The court's order protects the current leadership pending a hearing on October 4th. Governor Simnalai Fubara, WK's successor, has boycotted the party congresses in the state due to internal conflicts. 
Well, there's too many angles to look at this. Uh, so many expectations. It just seems like every other day is one new story, one new update in uh, River State. I, I, what were your thoughts when you first heard of the story? Well, I mean, it, it, the battle continues basically um, in in River State. You know, and it it's, it's it's political games. You know, and, you know, I've said I think I said this a couple of weeks ago that both of these men, the way it seems, it seems like both of these men go to sleep every night, Thinking permutating how exactly next to what what next person. strategy exactly like and how to game. and how to defend myself. You know, from what would possibly happen. You know, they definitely or I expect that they would also have insiders. You know, in the Abuja camp and insiders in the River State camp, you know, and both of them are constantly plotting, you know, on how to either attack or defend, you know, how do I bypass this new one that is coming? We heard, you know, about the possible move of um, um, Fubara's loyalists to the to APP, APP exactly. in River State, you know, and of course, you know, I also saw, um, I think it was yesterday, that the spokesperson of the PDP, I believe, in, in River State is also saying that they will not be a part of local government elections um, that, you know, are supposed to be forthcoming. And there are also speculations that uh, Simnalai Fubar himself may also move, move to, to the, the APP. APP. You know, so, again, it is a constant permutation, battle, attack, defend between these two people. Unfortunately, it definitely will affect governance in River State. It, I'm and sure it certainly The success does. of the uh, Sim Fubara administration. Will he even attempt or even bother attempting a second, second term in, in office? You know, I was going to say that if he comes out of this unscathed and is able to get into the second tenure, then I'll be reminded of the song by Destiny's Child, Survivor, because that should be his national anthem if he comes out of all of this. Because yeah. he feels like he's been ambushed on all sides from the beginning till you now. It feels like every other day, there is one, one issue or the other aimed at destabilizing the similar life of Barra administration. The weaker loyalists will not, they won't agree to them. So at the end of the day, the question I always ask is, do these people genuinely love River State? No, they do don't. they genuinely love the government? Do they genuinely love the people? Owing to the fact that it just feels like you've said that they, they've taken camps with different people, regardless of what happens. And I wish that some of these loyalists would tell themselves the truth and not look at who is feeding them and not look at who is paying their bills. And just genuinely look at the facts for what it is. Which situation will best benefit the people of River State? And then align themselves with that situation. Right now, you currently have a government. You currently have a government that is running. But how can the government best serve the people if the government is always looking for how to defend? Really? Yeah. So I think it's, it's pretty popularly known that politics in Nigeria, is, it, it, the people come at the bottom, you know, of the, of the reasons, uh, bottom of the ladder of the reasons where... Um, you know, behind polit uh, politicians, you know, and they're entering into politics. Service to the people is at the bottom. Um, to a large extent, you know, it is mostly power and access to resources. And that's why you can see this level of interest in getting into those positions. And that's why you can see the, you know, the do or die affair that they have with playing these political games. It has almost nothing to do with the people. Um, River State, as it stands, can continue to be at its current state or maybe even get worse um, for all these people care. That's not their major concern in whatever position that they are, as commissioner, as state house, house of assembly member, as national assembly member, as house of, Rep um, Rep house of reps member. It doesn't seem, I think it's safer to put it that way, it doesn't seem like the people of River State are important in any of their converse, conversations or in any of their deliberations um, going forward. And of course, um, four years is going to be up in a bit. Um, we will, of course, you know, have a scorecard uh, for Sim Fubara and, of course, you know, every other person who's currently in, in River State uh, uh, government. Let's uh, go on a short break. Of course, you, when we come back, we continue this morning with Breakfast Central. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll be reviewing the newspapers and joining us this morning is the publisher of CKN News, Chris Kendi Mwadu. Mwadu, good morning. Good Thank morning. you very much for joining me on CKN. <laughs> <Good morning. laughs> you know, I think this is a red season. Last time you came, you came yeah. with your Ishiagu and yeah. the red car. But yeah. today you're coming with a red shirt that has, yeah. I don't know which is that, me, I'm a bush care. I don't want to call that season. Ukwagu. Ukwagu. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the papers this morning. We're starting off with this Nigerian newspaper. On the front page, the big story says, Tinubu to sweep out Deadwood ministers. It will be interesting. Maybe I'll put Sikian on the spot and ask him if he were to name some Deadwood ministers who will make the list. Presidency confirms plans to rejig cabinet. This could lead to shoving aside officials who haven't pulled their weight over after more than one year in office. 
cut stops PDP and WC governor's BOT from dissolving reverse party executives. I'll upload integrity of judiciary, says CGN Kekerekun. As Senate confirms appointment, you can see her there in the picture taking a bow at the Senate chamber. Prices of beans, rice, other food items saw in August 2024, according to NBS. In fact, report has it that the bag of rice is now up to 105,000 naira. Anyway, we'll move on to other alternatives at this rate. Senate approves new 288 billion naira supplementary budget for FCT. That's all on this Nigeria. Let's move to the punch. All right. On the punch newspapers this morning, it says cabinet shake up. Tinubu demands 46 ministers fresh scorecards as lobby begins. Cabinet rejig will be, will be based on ministers' performance, says presidency. Political bigwigs, ministers intensifying lobbying. It's, it's just very interesting. And it really just tells you what the, the mentality is concerning these ministerial roles. It's, it's not necessarily, it doesn't seem like it's about service. If you are hearing about this type of lobbying for people to become ministers, it's not it's not necessarily about service. The one with the nosebone, very soon. <laughs> well, Yahaya Bello, EFCC files fresh 110 billion naira fraud charges. Uh, Dangote refineries, marketers plan direct petrol purchase. Federal government proposes NIN and tax for foreigners. Kikirekun warns uh, judges against corruption after Senate confirmation. And also Bob Risky. Minister orders alleged bribery probe. Falano plans suit. And also, Edo poll marred by vote buying. Delay, says uh, NBA observers. Those are the big stories on the um, Punch newspapers this morning. Daily Trust comes up next. All right, uh, on the front page of the Daily Trust, hardship. Civil servants go to work twice a week. Even feeding is difficult. Only Lagos, Ogun, Oshun approve of days. We pretend we don't know what's happening, according to director. It will lead to low productivity, analyst says. Publish your investigation report, discharged female soldier tells Ami. And I think that this is very important. It's on page 10 of the Daily Trust. Maybe we'll start off with the conversation. Uh, Kekere Akun confirmed that CGN vows not to condone corruption. 2009 agreement, salaries, ASU gives federal government 14-day ultimatum. Bob Risky, federal government probes allegation against uh, prison CG. MSMEs can't survive on current interest rates, according to Fidelity Bank MD. And why Tinubu can't intervene in Dangote NNPCL fuel price feud, according to the presidency. The presidency says President Bola Tinubu will not intervene in the controversy that ensued between Dangote and NNPC over the price of PMS. Uh, speaking with State House correspondents on Wednesday, Bayan Onanuga said the downstream petroleum sector has been deregulated. I mean, there are further details as to why, you know, they said, they, but we we'll probably will get into that. Uh, Sikian. I'm wondering which story we should begin with. Minister, please. All right, let's start with the ministers with Jigin. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's ask the cabinet shake up. So that will be from the punch. Tinubu demands 46 ministers fresh scorecards as lobby begins. Your thoughts on the potential rejigging of the cabinet that may or may not happen on or before the October, the first of October. Um, first and foremost, I don't think uh, they need to tell Nigerians that we need to rejig or. Uh, reshuffle cabinet. Um, you don't get to hear from the government of the United States of America, United Kingdom, or any of these countries telling that we are about changing ministers. It does. You don't announce that. It's something that you do quietly. You must have your KIP. You must have done your due diligence. And when you want to do that, you just a few hours or probably a day or two before they just call the ministers and say you'll be dropped. You know, because the essence you what to do is that by making those unnecessary announcements, they are putting everybody under pressure. Those that want to steal will use the opportunity to steal, steal the more. And uh, those that know that they're not coming back will want to do everything shady to be able to cover their trap. So it's not so the issue of uh, going to uh, is going to be one of before. Personal, that's my personal opinion. You don't need to tell us, just do the right thing. Then starting with the ministers, um, I think we will start from sacking the president. Forget that the, you've forgotten that the president is a minister. President is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and also the minister of petroleum. So we and need as, to start. As you're talking about that, in fact, I wanted to read something. You're very in the spirit. Okay. Uh, the PMS, this is Bayon Onuga's response okay. to why the presidency is not intervening in the feud between NMPC mm. and Dangote. Mm. The PMS regime has been deregulated. Dangote is a private company. Mm. NNPC should not forget that it is a public limited liability company, he said. Mm. Mm. Whatever controversy both of them are having is their problem. 
they are operating in terms of PIA. NMPC is on its own, even though it's owned by the federal government, the state government and local councils and everything, but it's operating as a limited liability company. So he said that it's their business. That is why I'm saying that the president should be sacked as the minister. I'm not saying sack the president. I say sack as a minister because the president is, if we're having 45 ministers, the president is number 46. He's the minister of petroleum. And if I look at that sector and what has happened within that sector in the past two years, then he has not performed. Forget the fact that we have the Dangote refinery on stream. But the promises made to Nigerians in the past one year that if, um, um, the Potako refinery will come on stream, we have been promised six times. They've moved that push six times. And if, if the president is the minister of petroleum, and that we're going to use that, the KIP on that to be able to judge him as a minister, then he has failed. That is one. That's so the minister and his minister uh, of state. But generally, if, you give, if I give my um, assessment of the situation, I would say that I don't have about, you cannot pick points about more than five ministers that have performed. To me, I, I run a program called Inside Politics with CKN on Silver Bay Television every Friday. And last week, I focused on this topic. That was what I, all I did. And I opened up the line for Nigerians to call. You need to see, see what Nigerians were saying. And each and every one of them had a reason why. Yeah, if you say you're going to put me on the spot, and I thought you would have, but let me put myself on the spot. Remove the Minister of FCT, probably the Minister of Works, the Minister of a Aviation, Interior. Minister of Interior. Four, I don't know if there's any other one that I can pick point that I'll be able to perform. Those, for me, for me, those are the four forerunners, as it were, as far as this government is concerned. Every other person around there, even um, the Minister of Solid Mineral that I spent so much from, so much from, I've not seen so much happening because uh, because Boston to because, ICT, because uh, ICT. He came with so much promises, but nothing. That is me. Then you go to power. The one that said that we should be putting up our freezer and be putting up our fridge. And every what is only interested is increasing tariff, asking the, uh, the regulatory authorities to um, to increase tariff every time. And you come to realize that. Using air condition is not a luxury in Nigeria. Are you aware of that? Very aware. No, many people, many people cannot afford to put on their... That it has become a luxury item. Even in the, the free and even those of those that they say are on band, band A and band whatever, are complaining. So it, do you need to tell me how much he has added to the national grid in the past way and what we have done to upgrade to from what he got and what we have. So those are the narratives for me. So good enough. Uh, you know, the president set up, uh, um, appointed a special advisor on uh, uh, monitoring. I don't know. The, yeah. uh, I don't. I can't remember the um, the designation now. But uh, that lady. For was that? The yes, the of the yeah, I so I want to see the KPI. I want to see what is used to be able to. But for me, I think that is obvious to you because at the end of it all, what people will be talking about in the next four years, are not the ministers. They are going to be talking about. President Bola Tinubu. Like now, can you remember how many ministers were in um, uh, former President uh, Buhari's regime? But whenever there is a reference, you say during Buhari's government. That's what everybody say. During Good Luck Jonathan's government. Yeah. During Yara Dua's government. During OBJ. Nobody is going to mention a single minister. So the president has to get it right. If he has a vision, he must be able to get it. Because I believe that most of these guys were just political appointees that he doesn't even know. Most of them. Uh, just people that we have picked and forwarded to him. Now he has worked with them. He has been on the stadium now. I think this is the right time for him to hit the ground running and making sure they have people who are, will be able to work with. And most often than not, not just political appointees, those that have... You saw what happened during the um, president of Basel University. They get away for technocrats, for goodness sake. He wasn't looking at party, my party, or no party. That is why you got people like Ngozi Okenje, Uwala, Obi Ezekwe Suli, um, um, even Nasir Rufai that was at BPE, and so many others. And you saw the performance and what, what happened. So for me, I think it's, the, it's for the president to be able to see. Let's see what he's going to pick. But what we have now is what we call in football second 11. Just like yesterday, when Arsenal played, look at the boys that we are used. Just a senior old boys. They, they did the job by defeating that thing by uh, five goes to one. Yeah, um, good thing you didn't mention Manchester United because you would have seen real tears. Now, on, on well, I'm a Man U fan. Forget, don't worry. We will, that's why we will rise again. Red. Yes, yeah, that's why we are in red. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, so I, don't, I, I don't want you to see red. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's also important. You know, mm. some some names exist, but 
they almost don't exist. Many people will forget that Boyega Oetola is a minister currently. Yeah. Minister of Blue, Marine Blue and Blue Economy. Blue Economy. Yes. What is happening in the sector? He is one of those names that exist, but four years is going to go by, and yeah. you would barely remember that this person was ever a minister. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Before we continue with the ministerial scorecard here, let's uh, take a call from Mr. Julius. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Mr. Julius, can you please turn down the volume of your TV set and then go ahead with your conversation? Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Go, morning. Go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I can do that now. How are you people? Well, very well. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice seeing you people this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please, I just want to comment on uh, the last person that uh, you people are interviewed, that uh, that uh, allergy that you people interviewed. I never know that there are people in Nigeria like that man. I never know that uh, there are men existing in this country that can come out and speak the truth. Please, I want to encourage you people to help Nigerians bring out men like that so that they can speak the truth. Because I know that with such men saying the truth openly, it might touch the heart of those that are our leaders. Because I know that a lot of evil men are surrounding them, questionable characters are surrounding them, and they are human beings. So the only thing I want to encourage you to know is if such men can be God, every day, at least, if they can come out once in a week and speak, All right. it will All get right. to the ears of our leaders All right. and we'll have a change. Mr. Julius, thank All you very right, much you. for calling. Uh, so we're still talking very quickly about the cabinet shakeup, and mm. you, you, were, you were talking about some of the ministers that have maybe performed. So what about uh, the Minister of, <coughs> Minister of Women Affairs? Why are, you, why are you always asking me for the Minister of Women Affairs? The last time I was, something was like the same thing you asked me. I did? Yes, you did. Well, you I, can't, I can't seem to uh, Maybe because you're a woman. Okay, yes, let's, I am. let's go there. And I'm very okay. passionate about I just about want women. to save you the. Well, uh, she's neither here nor there. Um, I believe that, um, yes, she had her work cut out. Uh, but the way Amana she goes about her duties is not that. You remember, the, the I remind you again for you to remember that. I, I think that was the day I was saying that. Why is it that maybe we should have minister, minister, minister of men, men affairs? affairs. I remember no, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember. So, you remember now? Yes, sir. Uh, so, so um, I believe that um, to a large extent, I should be able to do what she ought to do. But it's the way and manner she goes about it. You know, there's a way you can be able to do your job, but the controversial issues surrounding her ministry don't. Let us even take this. Let, let's take the latest. The lady that was um, have been disengaged. Um, by the uh, by the um, by the army yeah. um, uh -huh. uh, yesterday, she came out yesterday to yeah. say something. You know, the military came out with that statement that oh, she was disengaged because of medical issues, mental issues, blah blah blah. And okay, that is why today the lady has come out to say no. If you read the report, she said that she had a one-on-one -on -one with the minister of women affairs, and it was the women affairs minister that actually asked her to drop her letter, and um, that she finally did. Well, that she's so surprised now that that has been tied to mental issues and that the issue of mental issues were not discussed. But the only thing that it was discussed on, uh, around that is that, okay, that, that may en uh, enable her to get her entitlement or whatever and the rest of them. So that she will want the woman to come out, the minister to come out and say what happened as a mother. That in itself, in as much as I don't want to say that may be the truth, but that is the level of it. Then the existent ways of going about... Let me tell you, my idea of a uh, minister of women affairs is the days of Miriam Abanguda. That woman, I don't think there's any other, any first lady that ever actually worked. Better life for rural women. We saw how successful that program was, including the Beijing conference that we had. And you saw the way she touched the lives of men. She was, she was the first lady. She wasn't the right. minister of... You understand what I mean? Yeah. Those are the kind of narrative I want to see a minister because you are not... In as much as we have minister for youth development, minister of women affairs, this not only with women, but also children. children. Because when you are dealing with the woman, you are dealing with her children. So how far have we gone in dealing with issues? That, 
So those are th that's for me is the narrative. So I, I may not be in a better. You should be in yeah. a better position to so be able to I, I, I mean, I, I'm glad that you mentioned this. You know, and I really want to highlight it. It's a story mm. of Private Ruth Ogunleye, yeah. which is one of the stories I'd wanted to take it mm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Who had come out to call out Colonel Ib Abdul Karim mm -hmm. on TikTok, saying that he had sexually harassed her. Unfortunately, now she mentioned she actually mentioned two colonels and one brigadier general. Right. Not yeah. just two, one. So, so, um, so there's Colonel Ib Abdul Karim, Colonel G S Ogo, and Brigadier General Ib Sholebo. Yeah. Said they made her life unbearable. Mm -hmm. Now investigation has occurred. They've now said that they have fired her due to mental illness. But like you yes. said, yeah. she has called on uh, the Minister of Women Affairs, Obiano Ju, uh, Ohanaye Uju uh, yeah, Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. Yeah. to say that, look, you asked me to voluntarily submit yeah. my letter. Mm -hmm. Please come out and say what's happened. So I'm hoping that this is something that the Ministry what of is, Women what Affairs... What is even more intriguing for me is that the army was so silent on the investigation. Yeah. They didn't come out to tell us yeah, what she's, the actual... She has asked that they yeah, publish yeah, the details. Uh, can you hold on? Let's speak with uh, Kola Wale. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, please go ahead. Let me tell you, the man with you is very correct. The president is the minister of petroleum. Petroleum, they are afraid of in the country. I work with Mobi, and I know the integrity in Mobi. 1975, we produced crude oil. If I tell you the statistics of producing crude oil, crude oil, 800 other accessories come from crude oil. 14 major ones is the one you will get. Where is the money for those 14? You bring fuel from overseas, you pay drumage, you pay transportation, but now Dangote is there. You are not paying anything like that. Why are they telling us cost of fuel will not come down? Cost of fuel for Nigeria should not be more than 300 naira. Call me, I will give you the statistics. Dangote are just spoken with Boombaga, and he has exposed them. They should allow this country, the masses, to enjoy the dividend of what God has given us. The president, who is the uh, minister of petroleum, should bring the kaba, those kaba in the petroleum industry that are donating billions, billions that they should invest in their own state to see people to enjoy things. They are using billion now, donating billion all around. The president is the president and is the minister of petroleum. He should deal with the Kaba. He should not think of second term. Deal with the Kaba and let the masses put you in for second term. That is my thinking for this morning. I'm my thought for Nigeria. I'm a contributor to the newspaper this morning. Thank right. you. All right, thanks a lot. You know, let's move to another you know, conversation this morning. Um, on the punch, it says that Yahya Bello EFCC files fresh t uh, 110 billion naira fraud charges. And also, if you look at the bottom of you know, the punch, you know, there's the Bob uh, story there, which, of course, also robs uh, the EFCC. So I, I want to merge you know, both of them. Mm -hmm. I saw that the Minister of Interior has also ordered an investigation you know, into the allegations that um, you know, Bob did not spend um, his six months in jail in you know, an actual prison. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen the EFCC chairman, you know, order in, in an investigation. Um, but, I mean, if you can merge both of them, just, just get your reactions. Yes, we can merge them. Um, the EFCC uh, knew 115 or so billion naira uh, charges against uh, former governor Yaya Bello. And um, don't also forget that news coming is that Yaya Bello has gone to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, so, to stop his trial. Uh, this um, is very, very embarrassing for me. Uh, because this brings to question what was so we've had something similar in the past, and um, it's like just that Nigerians are short uh, when it comes to history. There was a governor, former governor of River State, uh, what's his name, uh, Peter Dili, yeah. that was charged for fraud and for embezzlement and the rest of them, and that case got up to the Supreme Court. 
where um, agencies of government were asked to stop the investigation. Have you ever heard that before? The pit of belief to today has not, was not investigated. And many people alluded to that. And that is when we come, the, the problem with some, our judiciary that people. Go. That was, I was when I was listening to the new uh, uh, CJN yesterday talking that, oh, corruption within the system is going to be dealt with. And I was just smiling. Because at the Supreme Court, Peter Obdili, graph agencies were stopped from investigating Peter Obdili indefinitely. And the wife was in the Supreme Court then. Till today, nobody has said anything. Now. And we have seen what happened. The fact remains that why is it difficult for EFCC and security agencies to be able to pick up? Yeah, yeah, That's a very good question you've asked. Well, let's hold our thought and take a call from Victor calling from Calabar. Good morning, Victor. Yeah, good morning. All right, please go ahead. Victor, can you please go ahead with your comment? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm calling in respect of the foil crisis. All right. Hello? Yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Please yeah, can go hear ahead. You. All right, yes, it seems well. that, yeah. Yes. So, that is that voice. So, the question I've asked is that why is it difficult for security agencies, EFCC, because the order was given, yes, for EFCC to be able to apprehend or to pick up the IAP. But that also means every security agency in Nigeria, wherever you see him, yep. pick him up. That's what that means. Because even if, if we send that to Interpol, so the question is, if it's any other Nigerian, they would have picked them up. Somebody is telling me, oh, it's because the... Um, uh, the governor of Kogi State is trying to be... You are not going for the governor of Kogi. Even if it's seen with the governor of Kogi State, you can be so able that's, to... So that's the excuse that so, EFCC had yes, given that, that um, Yahya Bello came to their car park mm. with the governor who yeah. has immunity yeah. and they were holding hands and yeah. any attempt... Also, they cannot be say... Yeah, they said that any attempt to pick him up because yeah. the governor, of course, doesn't work in no. him. He's working with the security yeah. detail. They say it will have led to anarchy. Which anarchy? Which anarchy? Which anarchy, for goodness sake, they are holding hands. Any attempt to... You are not arresting the governor of Kogi State. You are arresting the former governor of But Kogi. remember, so it's the same governor of Kogi State mm. that did not allow the arrest of the former governor sometime back in let me tell you, let me Let me say this. Until we have the political will to do what needs to be done, we won't get it right. I personally want to believe that some people in government, even at the highest level, presidents, if the president gives the necessary instruction today for Yahya Bello to be picked up, he'll be picked up based on God, the, those... Uh, 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 judge is so for him to be doing what he's doing definitely means that we have a say in my in my village when you see a man dancing uh, by the push part the person where they play the drum they inside bush. bush yeah that summarizes well so let's go to Bobrisky. Bobrisky and a very dark uh, woman is a big case and very 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 embarrassing uh, but, 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 but would you say not shocking no, of course not. When it's embarrassing, it's not shocking. No, no, no. No, it's, say, not, no, it's not, not shocking. shocking. Exactly. No, no, it's not shocking. No, shock, okay. Nothing shocking about Nigeria. I say it here time and time again that Nigeria is just like Charlie Boy Show. Have you forgotten what I used to say? Yeah. <laughs> that that anything can happen on Charlie Boy Show. That, no, for shock, no, no, I wasn't shocked. But that these revelations were made, for him to come back and be saying what he's saying, that, oh, no, he did that, is a lie. It's second guess. Now, uh, Faust was accused. First, I've come out to say, if you look at the statement that was said, within that statement, you will see that he even uh, he acknowledged that uh, Bob Risky contacted him yes. to give him three million naira, that he wants to use it in that. The fact remains that, good enough, the Minister of Interior have asked that that of prison should be investigated. The EFCC have asked for that other side to also be investigated. We need that investigation ASAP within 48 hours. They can get this done. So that we don't move, they don't just sweep it under the carpet. And, because what they have done is very, very embarrassing. What is happening is embarrassing. They should call a very dark man to present his case. They should call Bob Risky. To, then they should look at the accounts. There were figures that were, they were uh, people that were mentioned. Those that were fingered. I am not surprised. You say I'm shocked. I'm not shocked. Because it happens. Let me tell you, give you a classical example. Some time ago, I told you that for about 13 days, I was locked up at Ikoi prison. Mm. Yes, now. Maybe today they're talking. Yes, I was. 
If you journalist, if you never go to prison, you never, you never, uh, I'm not you, a go, you, you don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously not a you, no, you, never, you never practice. You never practice. Also, they pick you. When they lock you there for one year, you never practice. <laughs> you are shaking your head. That's how I was shaking my head too until I was picked up. You know, for a story that I published in 2015, and I said it, that the, the cyber crime law that was passed, that was signed into law in 2015 by former president, uh, um, good Lord Jonathan, as he was leaving, yeah. I was the first person that was used as guinea pig to test that thing. And I was locked up at Ikoi uh, prison for 13 days until um, I was released and rest of them. Within Ikoi prison, let me tell you that there are VIP, there are VVIP lodges. Okay? Okay. Yes. There, if you have the money, you can pay to be kept at the VIP. Most of those people, ministers, all these big, big boys, that's yes. where they keep okay. them. Then you have other one, pop, you have Populosa, you know what we call Populo, when we go to watch football, Everyone. you know they're popular. Everyone, this thing. Now, there are some privileges that some of these prisoners get that others don't get. So, for Bobrisis to come out and say that, oh, that she, he was kept away, he was in it, there's that possibility. I'm not saying it's true, but there's the possibility that that happened. But that says a very, very terrible precedent. If it's not, that issue is not dealt with. So, those, that issue should be, the federal government should be highly embarrassed. And the heads must rule if this is fine, if it's fine that, that this is the truth. Beginning from the head, not just because you know what we normally do is that uh, they will not pick up one or two small, small boys and say, that, including it. Let me look at what happened. The, the Donald Trump, yeah. you saw the attempt on his life. Yeah. And at the end of it all, this, the, the director of the state security, what they call them now, SSS. Uh, their, their own SSS, yeah. the woman came and resigned. She wasn't the one that was. Protect, she wasn't the one that was on ground to protect Secret the Secret Service, I beg your pardon. Secret Service, Secret yeah. Service. She wasn't the one on ground, but she was the head of the security, that security happy. And she said, after the interrogation and dressing, she came out and resigned and said, I have, I, I go. And that doesn't happen in Nigeria. So this issue should be investigated properly we, so that we don't turn ourselves to a laughing, a laughing stock. But the fact is that so many issues have not been raised about the EFCC, the integrity of the EFCC, and also the integrity of Nigerian prisons. Yeah. And that is terrible. All right. Sikian, thank you for joining us. We uh, are done, Abi. We are done. <laughs> <laughs> we are done. Yeah, yeah. The has a lot of questions. To they, do, they do. They and, do. And you know, that's part of what we'll be talking about. They Nigerians do. have reacted to Yahya Bello and the drama that has ensued. And that's what we'll be sharing. Your tweets on X. Up next on what Nigerians are saying. If the drama between Yahya Bello and the EFCC was a series, I've lost count which episode we are on because it still is ongoing. Yesterday, 25th of September, was the day that Yahya Bello was scheduled to appear in court. And again, he didn't appear. Now, recall that he's been, sub, he's been you know, declared wanted for the past few months. The EFCC and uh, Yahya Bello have been running around in circles. Just last week, we brought you an update about how Yahya Bello and Usman Ododo, the current governor of Kogi State, visited uh, the EFCC headquarters and were not arrested. And social media was filled with reactions. We took a number of these reactions to that story, talking about how uh, Usman Ododo aided, some would say aided Yahya Bello in evading arrest the first time and now walked him into the EFCC headquarters. The EFCC has responded as to why they did not arrest Yahya Bello. They've said that Yahya Bello walked into EFCC premises hand in hand with someone who has immunity and that him walking in with the governor of Kogi State hand in hand shows that if they had attempted in any way to effect an arrest, it might have led to anarchy because the governor does have immunity. Nigerians have started to wonder if Yahya Bello is bigger than the institution of the law enforcement agency called the EFCC and if he is above justice because he has evaded court six times, I think this will be the seventh one, and they're wondering what next. The FCC has gone ahead to file fresh charges. Remember that the initial charge against him was to the tune of 80.2 billion naira, and now they filed fresh charges of 110 billion naira. The FCC put out a press statement yesterday saying Yahaya Bello must have his day in court. And I'm going to read out a few, maybe an excerpt from it. It says, it is public knowledge that a former governor of Kogi State, Mr. Yahaya Bello, has made several unsuccessful attempts to throw spanners in the ongoing trial through some irresponsible and utterly rascal efforts 
the appropriate place of surrender would be before Justice Emeka Nwiti of the Federal High Court Abuja, before whom his legal team had undertaken to produce him to answer to the 18-count charges of money laundering preferred against him by the EFCC. Now, they've assured Nigerians that Yahaya Bello must have his day in court. The question is, do Nigerians believe the EFCC? Let's see what they're saying on X, as they all have started to react to this. And now, our first tweet uh, says, it's from Dr. Uke Mwamukai, says, is there really any need for this long statement? It's really a long read, I must promise you. You can get the full details on the EFCC website and uh, the EFCC X handle. He says, is there really any need for this long statement that is full of repetition? Given the faith of average Nigerians in the EFCC tanked a long time ago, I believe it should be obvious to the blind that EFCC is doing everything except diligently pursuing the case against the higher Bellu. Okay, let's sympathize with you that Bellu is being shielded by government security agents assigned to a sitting governor. But couldn't the commission have leveraged the support of the service chiefs to stand down those illegal protections and turn in the fugitive in handcuffs? And whenever Bello finally has his day in court, how can we be sure that the charges will not be too watery, having been watered down using under-the-table settlements, like the current Bob Risky gate, thus giving him the wiggle room to evade justice? The next tweet is uh, from Queen B says, thinking that you're going to fool us by this? Never, because we've been hearing this since the creation. Until Yahya Bello and his likes are behind bars, you're only but jokers and your chairman must resign as he has promised. Uh, the next tweet says, every federal institution intentionally reduces itself to ridicule. This is a badly worded statement. It is so bad, the author refused to put their name on it. Don't these people have any shame? And uh, the next one says, you guys are unserious and totally incompetent. You couldn't go after him even though you know where and how to get him. You declared him wanted and yet you couldn't arrest him when you had him in your premises. Official EFCC, you guys want to beg him to allow you to arrest him. Shame. Then Erega says, since Yahya Bello was declared wanted by the EFCC, why then is the agency relenting to arrest him? Be serious. Are you educated at all? Did you read where they said he hides in the governor's lodge in Abuja? Do you want the body to invade a governor's lodge that has immunity? Kestini asks. And Uche Uwanjagu says, this circumstance portrays the commission as a weak institution and a threat to democracy. Yahaya Bello now appears to be smarter than EFCC and the judiciary. This definitely undermines the effectiveness of the commission and the sincerity of its anti-corruption efforts. And finally, FSC says, at this point, I don't even believe that Yahya, Yahya Bello even presented himself to EFCC office. Nigeria is a joke. Well, Yahya Bello did present himself to the EFCC as alluded to in their statement on X, and they have said the reason why they did not arrest him. So yes, Yahya Bello is still wanted. Fresh charges to the tune of 110 billion naira have been filed against him. But truly, will Yahya Bello ever have his day in, in court? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. That's all that we have this morning on what Nigerians are saying. Justice Binta Nyako has withdrawn from Namdekanu's trial after Namdekanu questioned her compliance with the Supreme Court ruling. This decision introduces uh, further delays in a case that has been ongoing for over nine years. The detained leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdekanu, was seen shouting uh, while calling and asking why the Supreme Court um, and, of course, and its orders have continued to be neglected. All these things are online. Yeah. Yeah. Is it not page 18? Yeah. All these things are online. So I suggest that the journalists in this country actually take out time to do some basic research. It's not difficult, just minor research. Yeah. You will understand the virtuousness, the emptiness of all the charges against me. 
They kept, they kept switching the charges. They said I committed this crime in England, isn't it? Yes. And in nine charges leveled against me, this place where I committed this crime was London, United Kingdom. Yes. When my lawyers came to see me, to I defense. had a discussion with them mm -hmm. about how I'm going to defend myself. They remove it. I told them that no court in Nigeria has jurisdiction to try me. They removed that long. So you because, see. because since this offense was committed in England, yeah, so they said. Mm -hmm. It's only a UK court that can give a Nigerian court the authority to proceed, isn't it? Yes. They charge again. I remove London. Oh, location of the broadcast. Location of the, of, of oh, the broadcast. Yes. Contrary to section one, what is the one, 196? 174 of the Terrorism Prevention Act 2022. In violation of their own laws. That's in violation of their own laws. And you want me to stand trial under such circumstances? Is that possible? No, no. they can to stand trial where all these shenanigans are going on? It's not possible. Nandi Kanu asked the judge of the Federal High Court, Abuja, Binta Nyako, to recuse herself from his trial despite being in the custody of the Department of State Services, DSS, for over three years. The IPOP leader was frustrated and leaped into the dock, ordering his lawyer to sit down. Joining us this morning to x-ray this recent development is one who has been following this case very closely. His exec executive director, Lead Africa Network, Chukuka, Okay, well, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. All right. I would like you to give us your thoughts on uh, the updates regarding uh, Namdi Kanu and his uh, reaction, you know, in court as well as Justice Bita Nyako recusing herself from this matter. It's maybe going to elongate the matter as it's been referred to the chief judge who will then decide what the next cause of action is. But talk to us about your thoughts regarding this uh, new development. I would say that uh, first and foremost, uh, one we understand that the stance of Ananda Khan was from a knowledge position, from a scholarly position, uh, being able to reference uh, the document and of course uh, the constitution, uh, the previous judgment of the court. And um, uh, secondly also, he was able to point out the fact that yes, supposing in the case of DSS, we've always known them to flout uh, court orders, but I mean, it's an aberration for the courts not to respect uh, orders of the Supreme Court. And uh, by, by the virtue of taking a position in, in that particular matter, I think uh, Justice uh, Nyako was reasonably expected to respond in the manner she has done, uh, because, I mean, nobody is above the law, even for those that interpret the laws. And it's reasonably expected that it doesn't matter who is involved, it doesn't matter what, what the circumstances, Justice must not only be served, but be seen to serve, to be served. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've always, you know, argued that, you know, I mean, this case has gone on for too long, you know, and I think it's also a miscarriage of justice uh, for a case, you know, to have carried on for so long with the person, of course, incarcerated all this while, you know, except, of course, in the time when uh, he fled the country. Um, do you think that at this point, you know, we should be looking for ways that we can... Um, either speed up, you know, the process of his trial, if there will be a trial, or have a conversation on, you know, at least wrapping up this case, you know, between the federal government uh, and Namdi Kanu himself? Well, what, what I really see as a, a sustainable solution is a political solution which uh, has been the recommendation even from uh, the time of uh, President Buhari in office. But I think uh, what's uh, both the, the, the current administration and the... the the past administration has failed to do is actually to engage, being able to like, you know, uh, bring to fore some of the fears that the FG have. I could understand that some of the fear could be, so if you uh, explore political position and Nanda Kani is also left uh, out of custody, is he going to return back to, um, you know, the secessionist messages? How do we handle him thereafter? I mean, it's a tax. And then if you're also keeping him there, it's a challenge, but it, it's almost like having two options and feeling that the safer one for the FG is just to keep him incarcerated. And then on the part of the legal solution, why that at the end of the day may not really uh, uh, help that much is if the the, the, the the court comes up today now and uh, completely declare him discharged and acquitted, you know, as someone that is pursuing a just cause, uh, which means, and without really addressing like some of those agitations, then it will actually be agitation pro max two, right? We're going to see it in an unusual dimension. 
So it appeared that the FG is trapped in itself. But I think the, the, uh, in exploring political poli uh, 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 position would actually be to look at the substance of some of the agitations and see if the, 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 the FG could not only just, uh, uh, aside from placing conditions of you are going to discontinue with this and that, like some of this message, but addressing some of those uh, issues, you know, for a sustainable impact. Because the, the, the fact that the AG uh, and Nigerians need to, uh, to appreciate is that. Oh, okay. Uh, Mr. Okinwa, it seems that the network has been uh, interrupted. We hope that that can be sorted out and you can come back and continue the conversation. But I think another angle that Nigerians are a bit worried about is what the next steps will be from here. When the CJ and, you know, assigns this case, are we starting afresh from the beginning? You know, at what point is this picking up from? And with the swearing in of uh, the official appointment and confirmation of the new CJN, you know, will that in any way bring some hope? Does that bring some hope to the prosecutors in this case, to the defense counsel, to see that this might, you know, there might be some form of speedy adjudication? Welcome back, Mr. Okinwa. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. I, I don't yeah, know if you so, heard so, me or so. if you'd like me to retake the question. Okay, please do. Please do. Yeah, I was asking, you know, what's the implication of this matter being handed back to the CGN might, will mean for the case? And especially looking as we have a brand new CJN who's just been appointed by, uh, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, is there fears or are there fears as to the longevity of this case or how long it will be? Is it going to start again from the scratch? Or are we expecting that this new CGN will be able to ensure that, and, and the court system that we have will be able to ensure a speedy adjudication of the matter so that we can get to a conclusion soon? Yeah, yeah. as a matter of fact, um... I expect a, a speedy adjudication. And um, uh, when you have like a case of someone who who, who was docked, you know, uh, ranting out in the courts and telling uh, judges, right? Like telling a judge, telling lawyers, you know, those that should know better uh, what the constitution says, it should really be like an indices to, to, to the new CJN that this should not be business as usual. It should be a case of, Come on, you are dealing with someone that is knowledgeable, a high-profile case, and uh, be, be that as it may be, following things the right way. And not just high-profile high case, but high-interest case. Because you are talking about a case on which the destiny of a whole region and a core stakeholder in a nation, it's involved. I mean, I live in the Southeast, and every Monday we, we don't go to work. Doesn't it really trouble the FG? that may be like the, the economy of the nation, we're losing a lot of potentials on Mondays in the Southeast. Any responsible government should be consigned that one part of the country is suffering, you know, for, for, for the way like a matter like this is being handled. So what we would expect that within the next few months, in fact, as a matter of fact, before the end of this year, if the FG is insisting on legal solutions, then let it be. We need speedy, speedy adjudication. If the FG also want to explore political solutions, we've seen like a, a caucus of all the, the, the Southeast uh, legislators come together, that of governors. What exactly does the FG want again? Hiring people from the same region who are also not negotiating or even agitating for secession, don't they have the moral rights, the competence, the local standard to also speak in matters like this, and the FG will listen? What exactly is the interest of the FG in this case? Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, while we see, we'll wait to see how this turns out, you know, and of course, uh, Justice um, uh, Kikere Kun is a new CGN. We hope that, of course, you know, she also um, understands, you know, at least has a different approach, you know, towards all of this. Um, but I want to talk about Namdekanu himself. You know, I, I believe that you're currently in the Southeast, or at least you know well about, you know, what the current situation is in the Southeast. Do, does he still have that, you know, demigod, you know, personality? in in the southeast you know and of course if he is set free today what do you think the conversations will be like around the southeast so so i think yes and some first and foremost let me first say that nandekano is still very much influential and the impact is still very much visible in the southeast because 
we know that when Governor Peter Mba came, I mean, he felt that, um, you know, by, by using kinetics and force, he's going to get all the workers, get the state functioner. But even the state in doing all he could do, we see a Governor Peter Mba banning people that do exercises on Monday from coming there to exercise on Monday. So invariably, governor, government also like uh, inadvertently, uh, uh, you know, observing and recognizing uh, they sit at home. Uh, but beyond that, like releasing it on the canoe, one of the ways we can actually forestall that, it's through negotiation. Don't forget that he is not just speaking for himself. And if at the end of the day, some of those issues he raised, and there are alternative ways to actually address this issue. And he's saying that even if that is done, I mean, we, we still want a divided Nigeria, we still want to go away, then that actually means that he's self-seeking and not really fighting for a region and uh, should be handled the right way, right? You know, I mean, the constitution of Nigeria recognizes the um, Again, struggling with the uh, connection there with uh, Chukuma Okenwa, who's speaking about the uh, well current legal uh, situation with uh, Namdi Kanu and, of course, the federal government. Uh, this is where we will be wrapping up the conversations uh, for this morning on Breakfast Central. Thank you very much for joining us. Of course, News Central continues for the rest of today with very interesting programming that I believe you should you, um, stay to watch. Um, I would like to wrap up, you know, by once again, you know, putting out my reminder. Um, I think I, I said this a couple of weeks or months ago, that any government that doesn't take intentional and deliberate steps towards fixing Nigeria, again, is simply wasting your time. You would never get the four years or eight years back, you know, from any government, uh, you know, that doesn't actually fix Nigeria. Your time will be wasted away. Your country would never, wouldn't get better. It would arguably get worse. Politicians arguably would get richer and you would stay in the same situ situation or maybe worse. And so that should be the mindset with which we um, review the performance of every government that takes office in Nigeria. I am Osaogi Ogbon. And I am Olive Emodi. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back again to wrap up the week. Same time. <music>